Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Facebook Live from Chisholm, Chisholm and Kilpatrick. My name is Christian McTarnigan and today I'm joined with Elise Goloski and Mike Lestrato. Uh, and he, today we are talking about headaches disabilities, migraine headache disabilities. So let's just start at a really basic level. Elise, why don't you tell us what a migraine headache is? Sure. So really generally it's a type of headache that usually is accompanied by other symptoms. So it's not just head pain, you're also going to get light sensitivity, sometimes dizziness, um, sometimes nausea. So it's a type of headache. So are there any particularly common associated triggers for a migraine headache? Yes. Yeah, so it, there's a very wide variety. Actually, hormonal changes is one. For example, when a woman is starting her menstrual cycle, um, that can trigger a migraine. Uh, alcohol, different types of alcohol can trigger migraines, wine, beer. Um, stress, changes in your sleep uh, can trigger migraines, uh, certain medications, as well as um, even the weather. So um, migraine seems to be a really particular type of headache. Mike, are migraine headaches the only type of headaches you can get VA disability compensation for? That's a great question, Christian. Um, and the answer is, the short answer is no. If you look at the schedule of rating disabilities under headaches, there really is only one listed. It's mm -hmm. migraine headaches. Yeah, it specifically lists migraine. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yep. But that shouldn't, um, don't let that deceive you into thinking that veterans can only apply for specifically migraine headaches. There are other, you know, all kinds of other types of headaches, whether it be cluster headaches, tension headaches, maybe, maybe just an unspecified or general type of headache. Mm -hmm. um, all of those can be service connected and veterans can receive compensation for them, um, despite the fact that the rating schedule only specifically lists migraine headaches. Mm -hmm. I've definitely had a few clients that have had diagnosed tension headaches or something to that effect, and it doesn't matter. It should still be rated under the, just the specific headaches, although it says specifically migraine migraines under the VA rating schedule. So you had mentioned something, Mike, you had mentioned the concept of service connection. Um, so do you want to explain to our viewers what service connection is generally? Sure. So generally speaking, service connection just means that the veteran's condition um, was caused by their active military service. Mm -hmm. And so there were, generally speaking, three principles that a veteran needs to show to establish what we call direct service connection. Um, so in that context, veterans typically need to show that there is some type of in-service event, disease, injury, occurrence. Mm -hmm. um, they also have to show a current disability. So in the context of headaches, they need to show that um, you know they have a headache. Maybe, and we'll probably discuss this in a second, not sure, necessarily sure. a diagnosis of yep. a headache, um, but they do need to show a current disability. And finally, they need to show what's called a nexus, which is the legal and medical link between the in-service event and the um, current disability. So, uh, you know, you could have, you could unfortunately have been, um, you know, uh, exposed to some sort of blast in service that could count as an in-service injury. Then you have a uh, headache disability currently, um, and then you have some sort of, it's typically medical evidence, right? That's linking that in-service blast to your currently, uh, you know, not diagnosed, but your current headaches disability. Um, and that would be the three elements of service connection that you would need to sort of get service connected for that disability. So you teased this a little bit, Mike, Elise, do you want to talk a little bit about sort of the diagnosis disability concept sure. in VA law? Sure. So like Mike said, you don't actually need to have an official diagnosis um, to be considered disabled or have, having a disability under VA law. What you do need to have is um, some type of effect on your functional loss or effect on your ability to earn wages. Uh, so a good example of that is pain. Um, if you have had pain but you don't actually have an underlying diagnosis, you can still be considered having a disability so long as you can show that that head pain somehow affects your ability to earn wages. It doesn't have to completely make you unemployable. It just maybe it makes you late sometimes. Maybe it makes affects your concentration. Um, it just has to have some type of um, functional functional effect. And that's VA law's definition of what a disability, right? What constitutes yes. a disability yeah. under the under VA law. Yes. Okay. And that's a somewhat new concept. Yeah. Um, that's a new case called Saunders v. Wilkie where they, they laid that out. So you still might have some trouble. It's definitely easier to get service connected when you have a diagnosis. Uh, so would encourage you to go ahead and try and get a diagnosis, but technically you don't need one. Yeah, that's something I, we're going to talk about pitfalls sort of throughout the process and a little bit more in a, in a, a section 
mention at the end of this talk, but um, something you definitely need to be on the lookout for is being denied solely because you don't have a diagnosed disability. Um, like Elise noted, this is a relatively new case. Sometimes getting these cases up and going and having the cases or the service connection claims adjudicated based on new cases can take a while. So definitely I would keep a lookout for that um, if you're applying if you're applying for uh, disability benefits and you don't have a diagnosis. Um, but that aside, Mike, uh, there are certain types of disabilities that can be considered service connection on a presumptive basis, even if they're completely undiagnosed. Is that correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. And I think um, what we commonly see is this take place in the context of uh, Persian Gulf War yep. veterans. Um, so under U.S. Code Section 1117, mm -hmm. there's a presumption that's afforded to Persian Gulf, certain Persian Gulf War veterans. Um, and this is a very complicated area, and yep. I know that we have material on this on our website. Um, but generally speaking, what this allows is for veterans who have perhaps an undiagnosed illness mm -hmm. or what's called a, um, a, a muckmi. Mm -hmm to still be able to establish service connection on a presumptive basis, um, despite the fact that, like we were saying, they may not have a formal diagnosis for headaches. And I think you, you might have mentioned this, but this has sort of a, it's a Persian Gulf War concept, right, in terms of those who have served uh, overseas in the Persian Gulf? Yeah, so specifically we're, we're looking at um, veterans who served in that region. Yep from August 2nd, 1990 until, let me just get it right here, December 30, uh, 31st out to 2021 mm -hmm. um, currently. And so, you know, if you're a veteran and you served in the Persian Gulf War um, during that period and, you know, you have pain that's related to what you feel is a headache or a migraine headache, uh, it's worth taking a look at that specific regulation or statute to see whether you can apply on a presumptive basis. Mm -hmm. And pre a presumption would mean that <clears throat> you wouldn't need that nexus element that you were talking about before. If you served in that in the in the appropriate area at the appropriate time, and you have an undiagnosed disability that's that's consistent with the uh, with pain, um, it's possible for you to get service connected without having to have medical evidence or that sort of link between the service incident in your current disability. Yeah, that's a great point. Basically, yeah. the presumption allows for a shortcut. Yep. So the veteran still has to have a current disability, um, so a headache. Um, but really what the presumption does is allows them to um, not necessarily have medical evidence that provides a specific medical nexus. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's very helpful to veterans who maybe can't obtain that type of medical evidence. Yeah. And so um, <clears throat> shifting gears, uh, typically when you're not <clears throat> going to get service connected on a presumptive mm -hmm. basis, at least, uh, you do need that nexus, right? And a lot of yes. times that comes in the form of a compensation and pension examination. Mm -hmm. Uh, to our veterans, veteran listeners uh, and watchers, it's probably uh, not a foreign concept to them mm -hmm. um, to have to go to a CMP exam. So, but specifically for headaches, right? Could you maybe explain a little bit how those CMP exams would work? Sure. So, a CMP exam for headaches, if it is, if the board does request a nexus opinion, which uh, usually they will, um, when you're looking for a service connection, there will be an opinion about nexus. It would be the examiner would ask you for your history, when did your headache start, um, and then they would make an opinion as far as whether your headaches are related to your service. Uh, but some other questions that you might see in there, I have to say. It's a very generic exam. Mm -hmm. It's one of the more generic exams. Um, you're seeing really just check boxes. Um, are these headaches prostrating, which we'll get into the definition of that in a little bit, but are these headaches prostrating, yes or no? There's usually not really an explanation about what that means even, what the examiner's view of that definition is, um, and why they're determining that your headaches are, are not prostrating. They also have, um, instead of really getting specific about how frequent your headaches are, they tend to have more like check boxes boxes occur um, X amount of times a month rather than being really specific to your actual case um, and anything else sometimes they don't get into yeah, any other five, symptoms less than five yeah that sort of thing. yeah and you have to fit into one of the boxes mm -hmm. so it doesn't it, they don't do a great job at painting your actual functional loss um, so as far as the, the headache exams are concerned so yeah so the point here being that if you do get an examination even for purposes of service connection mm -hmm. there's usually going to be a severity in uh, a severity component of that examination because if you do get service connected then Correct. they're gonna have to decide on what rating you should get um, so uh, I think uh, 
something that um, our listeners would be interested in mm-hmm. is what happens if you go to a CMP exam and mm-hmm. it's an unfavorable exam. So it either determines that there's not a nexus to service, um, and you know later we're going to talk about ratings. Um, so why don't we just start there? Sure. So if it's something that where they're saying um, there, it's not related to service, there are a couple things you can do. Um, you can get go out and get your own private exam. Um, you can definitely, absolutely, no matter what, get a copy of that exam and see if there's anything in that exam that you can challenge. Um, maybe there's something that was written down there that you didn't say, or there's something that you said that wasn't written down there, just for an example. Uh, so you can challenge that actual exam. One thing as far as nexus is that as a non-doctor can't do, unfortunately, Unfortunately, is is make that nexus. So that's really why your own private doctor is going to help you with the nexus. But when we're talking about severity, which is the step after you get service connected. Mm-hmm absolutely submit your own lay statements because you are competent to say how your headaches affect you. You are competent to say how severe they are. Um, so as far as the nexus, you might have to get your a, a private medical doctor to dispute that. But if it's just them saying that your headaches aren't that bad, submit your own lay statements. Submit lay statements by people who love you or people who work with you who have seen um, you know, how your headaches can really affect your day to day. So we're going to turn to you, Mike, and ask a question about the Appeals Modernization Act. So if a veteran needs to submit new evidence with an appeal, what should uh, that veteran know about the AMA? So the AMA, just to take a step back, is the new appeals system, um, which was enacted into law and is now in place for uh, veterans filing claims and for decisions issued on or after February 19th of this year. Um, And essentially what this does is if a veteran has previously filed for service connection for a headache condition Mm -hmm. and has been denied and is looking to now refile for that condition, they're going to need to provide, um, along with their new supplemental claim, what's called new and relevant evidence. Um, And so this is, as the regulations state, this is a low standard, but it's a standard nevertheless. Um, And what that really means is that a veteran is going to need to provide some type of evidence um, that didn't exist or wasn't already considered by VA at the time of the initial denial. So what we can do in these instances is oftentimes provide uh, updated treatment records. We can provide updated you know, progress notes. We can provide uh, new lay statements, all that which detail maybe the new severity of the condition. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, submitting that along with a supplemental claim in the AMA will likely be enough to meet that very low threshold for new and relevant evidence. Um, but it is different than the, than what we call the legacy system or the old system. Yep. So I think it's really important for veterans to know that um, if they've previously been denied for service connection for this condition, that they are going to do going to have to do something a little bit extra mm-hmm. and provide evidence in order to um, essentially reopen their, their claim. So what would happen, let's say, if a veteran didn't provide the correct type of evidence to either, with an appeal in the AMA, um, what would what would uh, the result of that be? So it's very likely that if a veteran is submitting a new claim, a supplemental claim, yep. um, and they don't provide any evidence, it would be denied on that basis alone. Yep. Okay. VA probably wouldn't even reach the merits to the underlying question of whether service connection is warranted. Um, and so if, you know, the good thing about the new system is that veterans can continuously refile mm-hmm. um, a supplemental claim mm-hmm. as they obtain and can submit new and relevant evidence. Okay. But it's really right. important for, um, you know, veterans to maintain the same effective date that they do provide new and relevant Mm -hmm. evidence at the time they're submitting their appeal or the claim. Okay. So sticking on the theme of service connection, Mike, and and, and sticking uh, with you asking you this question. Um, So before we get to ratings, secondary service connection. Could you explain that concept? Sure. Uh, And this is an important concept. Previously, we were speaking about direct service Mm -hmm. connection. Um, Secondary service connection is different in the sense that if a veteran has a service-connected condition which causes, contributes to, or um, further aggravates sure. a, uh, a non-service connected condition, then that non-service connected condition can become service connected um, by virtue of it being caused by the service connected condition. So that's, yeah. that's a little complicated. Um, but you know, for instance, we see this oftentimes in the context of, say, a uh, neck condition. Okay. A veteran may have a service connected neck condition, which then has developed over time and become more severe and is now causing the veteran to experience headaches. Yeah. So despite the fact that the veteran's headaches may not specifically stem from an in-service event, 
Um, the fact that the headaches are now being caused by another service-connected condition, in this case, the neck condition, mm -hmm. the veteran um, will be able to file and likely succeed on a claim for secondary service connection of that headache condition. So <clears throat> you have a uh, service-connected disability that causes the headaches. Yep. That's one way to get secondary service connection. So let's say, Elise, that the service-connected headaches disability causes something else. Mm -hmm. What happens then? Well, then you could, if, if you're service connected for that headache condition, mm -hmm. you could get ser secondary service connected for that second disability. But if you don't have, um, do you mean if you're, if, if the condition, if, do you, are you talking about a line or? Yeah, like let's say you have a headache okay. disability and it causes uh, you to become depressed. What would happen sure. in that situation? Um, so, so long as the headache condition is service connected, yep. then you can get service connected for the headache condition. But if we're going to expand this hypothetical for the depression, for the yep. depression. if we're going to expand the hypothetical more and say that your service connected C spine condition, your neck condition, mm -hmm. caused or aggravated your um, headaches, mm -hmm. then then that also caused depression, you could you could technically get both secondary service connected for the headaches and then yep. for the um, for the depression. Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, but you have to you have to start with something that's service connected. And for I know that um, some of my veteran clients take some pretty serious medication yep. for their migraine yep. headaches. These can be incredibly debilitating, incredibly mm -hmm. painful, um, and that can really be uh, tough on on one's gastrointestinal mm -hmm. system. So if there were an ulcer or some sort of gastrointestinal disability, mm -hmm. then even that could mm -hmm. potentially be service connected because you have to take your medicine to treat your service connected disability, mm -hmm. and that's causing another disability. So, yeah. um, and the reverse works as well. Yep. So if a veteran has a service-connected condition that's a, not a headache condition, mm -hmm. um, and they have to take certain, certain medications for that condition, and one of the side effects of that medication is that it causes headaches, Sure. Um, mm -hmm. then that's yep. a basis as well for a veteran to claim service connection for the headaches based on the fact that they're taking medication for yeah. a service-connected condition. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's an important point to make that um, even when we're not even talking about the secondary service connection realm, so long as your medication that you're taking is prescribed and it is based on something that's service connected, the effects of that uh, con that condition can be compensated for. So, for example, if you are on medication, pretty severe medication for a pain condition or your headaches, and it causes you not to be able to drive and now you can't work, well, then you could potentially get TDIU for that, even though it's really technically the medication and not the underlying condition, so long as the, the reason for the medication is service-connected. So before we move on to ratings, I just want to make one point. Although you can get secondary service connection for a lot of this stuff, um, if you're, if you, let's go back to our previous hypothetical, if your headaches make you depressed, um, mm -hmm. but you already have a rating for a psychological disability, you can't get two depression ratings. Mm -hmm. One, because of something that happened to you in service, made you depressed, and two, because your headaches make you depressed. That would be called pyramiding, and that's not allowed mm -hmm. because you would be getting double compensation um, for the same disability. So that's just something to yeah. keep in mind um, for veterans who are trying to apply for secondary mm -hmm. service connection and things like that, that you can't get two ratings for the same symptoms that's not allowed under even if law. you're diagnosed with two different types of headaches if really the yes. symptoms are very similar you could be running into a pyramiding issue when yep. you're only going to get compensated for one of them did you have something to add? No, that I was going. Yep, I was going to add Elise's point. That's a great point. Um, you know, we were talking about before the fact that, despite the fact that the rating schedule only lists migraines, you can be service connected for various types of different migraines. Yep. That's true, but along the lines of yeah. what you were saying with pyramiding, you're only going to be actually compensated for you know basically one yep. of the headaches. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get a attention headaches rating and exactly. a migraine headaches rating exactly. at the same time. Yep. All right, so we've been talking a lot about service connection, secondary service connection. Let's get into ratings. Um, do you want to explain how uh, the rating criteria for headaches works, Elise? Yes, so it is what we call a successive rating criteria. Um, what that means is, if you think of it as um, uh, the lowest criteria is you need symptom A, and then to get the next rating you need symptom A plus B, and then for the next you would need A plus B plus C. Um, the idea being that they all build upon one, one another, um, and you need all three to get the third highest. Uh, that's what's called a successive rating criteria. For the migraine or the headaches rating criteria in general, that is going to be found under 38 CFR 4.124A, and that's diagnostic code 8100. Um, the lowest code here is a non-compensable or a 0%. 
the uh, terminology in this in this uh, diagnostic code is pretty general overall. Um, actually, there are a lot of words that that don't really have definitions. <laughs> um, but a, a non-compensable, you're going to be looking at something that means just with less frequent attacks. So um, it's hard to, to say what that exactly means. Uh, the board hasn't really said it. The VA hasn't really defined mm -hmm. what that means exactly. Um, the next highest has our favorite word, or at least in VA law, which is prostrating. And I say that because um, no one really knows what that means. Uh, there are some definitions of it, which we will get into, uh, but it it's difficult to know what prostrating means, uh, especially because the next three criteria have it, uh, but they differentiate between different types of prostrating. Um, they also have a severe uh, frequency rather component. So the prostrating component is really the severity. The next component component is your frequency. They go up to fifty percent. Mm -hmm. um, I could go into all of them specifically, but you can find this online. Like I said, it's Diagnostic Code eighty one hundred. Um, but it, what is important to know is they have this prostrating component and then the frequency component. Do you want to maybe let us know the, so we can talk about sort of the subsections? Yeah. Or do you have the rating criteria in front of you, Mike? Sure. Do you want to uh, read the 50% rating and then Elise, do you want to talk about maybe what some of these words mean? Yes. Sure. So uh, for a veteran to obtain the highest rating under Diagnostic Code 8100 for migraines, they would have to show, um, and this is the terminology of the Diagnostic Code, they'd have to show with fr very frequent, completely prostrating and prolonged attacks productive of severe economic inadaptability. Um, so that's kind of a mouthful. And as Elise was saying, the regulation doesn't really go into defining the terms. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, if we were to look, you know, VA has its own adjudication manual that it mm -hmm. uses, and it attempts to define some of the terms there. Um, but I think, generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that a lot of the terms in this particular diagnostic code go uh, unfortunately undefined and that makes it very difficult for the board and yeah. for the regional office um, to really then assign the appropriate rating. Yeah, absolutely. So what little so what indication do we have at all at least about what Prostrating, prostrating means. means. Yeah. So, and when you look at when VA actually does adjudicate it, usually what they do is they look both to the dictionary mm -hmm. and um, to the M21. So, the dictionary usually defines uh, prostrating as complete physical or uh, mental exhaustion or complete exhaustion or powerlessness. You'll see kind of a combination of those words. Um, hard to say even though what that means. What does it mean to be completely exhausted and powerless? Uh, the M21, which is the adjudication manual, adds a little bit, but still, again, to be honest, it's not super, pretty vague. it's pretty vague. Yeah. Um, there are two different types of prostrating within this rating criteria. One of them is characteristically prostrating, and then the higher one is completely prostrating. So the M21 defines characteristically prostrating as causing extreme exhaustion, powerlessness, de debilitation, or incapacity capacitation with substantial inability to engage in or ordinary activities. The uh, definition of completely prostrating is basically the same except for without this substantial inability, they have essential total inability hmm. to engage in, or in ordinary activities. So the difference is they're saying basically one of them is of substantial inability to engage in activities and the other one is a total inability. Yeah. Um, Tough to say what an ordinary activity is, but usually when you when you are having to go to sleep or lay down in a dark room or yep. sit on the floor and you can't engage in anyone, that's when you start to see more of a prostrate. Uh, more examiners find that your headaches are prostrating. If you're someone who can work through your headaches, it's difficult to prove that your headaches are what's considered prostrating because they're not causing extreme powerlessness, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the sleep is a really good example of it. If, if you have to just lay down and kind of close out the world with your migraines, which is pretty common. Um, but it can be difficult because like we said, um, that is for migraines, that's kind of common to have to lay down, be completely dark. But if you just have tension headaches, mm -hmm. uh, you don't always have to do that. You can sometimes work through them. They can be very distracting, uh, but you don't necessarily need to go to sleep. So that's where we run into a lot of difficulties with the rating criteria is this is trouble with this prostrating, um, this prostrating element, but as of now, we do have to show it to get a to get a higher rating because it is a, what's considered a successive rating criteria. You do need to show that to get at least a ten percent. 
And so there's one more phrase in uh, the rating criteria, and um, it's a bit of a tongue twister. So it's severe economic inadaptability. Mm -hmm. Does anything tell us what that means? <laughs> Either of you? Yeah, putting so that out to both of you. This is <laughs> this is admittedly pretty difficult. I would say to really nail down. Um, we know from VA's adjudication manual that they use that it doesn't necessarily mean that the individual is incapable of any substantially gainful employment. At least that's what they say. Okay. Um, and so outside of that, I think it's really important for veterans to know that if they're seeking a 50% max rating and they need to show this severe economic inadaptability, what they really should be looking for is um, symptoms that force them to take a break from whatever they're doing and go down, mm -hmm. lay down in a dark room sure. where they, they really can't do much of anything. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know they have stopped work completely. Yep. Um, maybe they need to take two days off a week. Maybe they need to take one day off a month, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and it, maybe they don't take any days off, but they're just really powering through, and the severity of their condition is capable, um, essentially, of providing that economic inadaptability. But it hasn't actually, to this, to, you know, to this point in time, caused them to take time off from work. It's it really goes to the severity of the condition and how it impacts mm -hmm. the veteran's ability to to work and function. Um, and so, you know, we'll get into this a little bit later, but I think this can really be really teased out in a, in a good lay statement. Yeah, absolutely. And so, Elise, mm -hmm. the rating criteria says productive of right. severe economic inadaptability, but that's not exactly what's required, right? Yes. Yeah, so actually, all you need to show is that it's capable of. There's case law on that. You don't need to show that it actually causes severe economic inadaptability. Just as Mike was saying, it's capable of doing so. Yeah. Um, so again, it, there is some overlap with the prostrating. It, you're showing how severe it is and how that could potentially impact your employment. Um, but you don't have to show that it actually does. It's not TDIU. Um, so, and the case law says you don't. That's one of the most common mistakes that you're going to see in these headache claims, at least when you're getting into the, these more severe 50% realm cases, is they deny you a 50% because you, you're working, basically. Um, first, you, you can be working. This is not, like I said, IU. You do not have to not be working. Um, so severe economic and adaptability, even though it's hard to say exactly what that means, we know it doesn't mean complete unemployability or even an inability to engage in substantially gainful employment which is the standard for TDIU, um, because it's only a 50% rating, right? If you, if you met that higher, you would be getting a 100% rating if, you were, um, if your disability was preventing you from substantially gainful employment. Um, the, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's okay. Well, I wanted to sort of tease out uh, where you kind of ended that thought, which yeah. is uh, about TDIU. Yes. So, um, Mike, why don't you pick it up from there? Sure. What what happens if so? You have so your headaches are capable of producing severe economic inadaptability. Let's say you have a fifty, but what if your headaches are even more severe than that? What if your headaches stop you from being able to to work? There's an additional benefit that veterans can seek, and shorthand is TDIU, but it basically means mm -hmm. uh, total disability based on individual unemployability. Mm -hmm. And again, that just means that the veteran's service connected disability, so in this case, service connected headache condition, yep. would um, preclude the veteran from being able to obtain or continue maintaining uh, what's called substantially gainful employment. So they're basically their ability to work. Um, so if a veteran has a service-connected headache condition, um, perhaps they're being compensated at the 50% rate already, Yep. but the severity has increased or they feel that the 50% rating doesn't accurately really contemplate the, the real severity of their condition, they can raise TDIU um, by submitting a letter and saying that they're seeking this benefit. Um, there's an additional form that they will probably have to fill out as well, um, but raising the benefit to VA will let them know that you're seeking unemployability benefits due to your service-connected uh, headache condition. All right, great. So. Um this has been a lot of information. We've mm -hmm. sort of been talking about a lot of different elements of headaches claims, uh, both service connection and rating. Um, one of the things that we always also like to, to talk about, and we have been talking about it throughout the whole presentation, the whole talk, is what are some common pitfalls that you think we should um, let people know about in terms of VA's adjudication of headaches disabilities? 
sure. So it, it, one of the good things about the fact that we don't have really any definitions for what it means to be prostrating or even what it means to be sub, um, capable of con- of causing severe in- economic inadaptability is the fact that um, VA, at least in their board decisions, are supposed to be uh, actually defining those things, and they're not. Um, so that's one, of, uh, at least at court, that is a very, very common argument that we will make. Um, the reason for that is that you as a veteran um, are entitled to know what the what the standard is that you're being required to meet. It shouldn't just be some a word that that means nothing to you. Um, they have to explain what what it takes to be prostrating, for example, and why why your actual disability doesn't reach that level, and what a disability might look like if it did reach that level. Um, usually, you don't see that. Usually, you just see this isn't prostrating, or um, they just rely solely on a, a VA examiner check mark that says it's not prostrating without any further discussion uh, and that's inadequate that's a that's a very common one another one and I know we were just talking about this but that um, the severe economic and adaptability it has to just be capable of it it doesn't have to actually cause it kind of going off what we were talking about before mm-hmm. that's another really common one yeah and I think um another common mistake that VA often makes in adjudicating these claims that I see is VA will consider the effects of medication the veteran's taking. Absolutely. Um, That's a good point. And so, you know, as you can imagine, oftentimes veterans who experience headaches or migraines will take pain, some type of pain medication sure. to help them deal with that pain. Yep. Um, and so we oftentimes, unfortunately, see VA examiners say, uh, well, yes, you have um, maybe severe headaches, but you're taking pain medication that allows you to function on a daily basis yep. um, and takes care of all of your symptoms, and therefore you sh- shouldn't be rated as highly. Um, and that's really not correct. Yeah. Um, in, uh, specifically with this particular disability, um, you know, veterans should not be, uh, or rather, veterans' use of medication should mm-hmm. not be held against them sure. when considering how high their headaches rating should be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so don't let a VA examiner downplay your symptoms just because you're seeking medication. Sure. That's improper. Yeah. Another thing I'd like to add too is, um, and we were talking about secondary service connection earlier, VA has to really consider not just direct service connection, but secondary service connection when they're adjudicating your case. And oftentimes we'll see that they just solely decide the case based on whether direct service connection has been established or not. Mm -hmm. But they they do need to, and if they don't, you should raise it to them, they do need to consider all theories of service connection, including secondary service connection. So just keep that in mind as a, a really another alternative basis to hopefully establish your claim. Yeah, so if VA is only looking at whether your headaches were caused by something that happened in service, um, <clears throat> make sure that if your headaches are maybe being caused by a, another service-connected disability, that VA is adjudicating that as well. They don't just stop at step one. And I just want to emphasize this point, although you said it, um, we're just talking about headaches specifically when it comes to medication. There's a sort of a larger yes. issue looming out there, <laughs> but I just sort of wanted to make that clear without going into the, the weeds there, that we're just sort of talking about that concept mm-hmm. with respect to 8100. Right. The, the mm-hmm. same doesn't necessarily apply to things like um, hypertension sure. and arguably psych. Yep. Um, so we're, like you said, we're just specifically talking yep. about migraine headaches and the fact that the VA can't use your use of medication yep. against you. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, um, I think we're getting pretty close to wrapping up here, uh, but we always like to sort of leave with some parting thoughts. Um, Elise, you want to share maybe a thought or two, a parting thought or two about something that um, veterans watching this should keep in mind when they're trying to pursue their headaches claim? Sure. Um, So I know I was very honest about how I feel about the CMP exams (laughs) and how, you know, effective or how detailed they are, but one thing that you should do is always attend them um, because you need to basically, VA I will say this, their duty to assist is a, is a two-way street. Yep. Um, so if you don't attend the exam, then uh, you're kind of stuck. Uh, yep. It's hard to make any duty to assist you know, arguments because you're not actually attending the exam. So do your best to attend those exams and at those exams be as detailed as possible. Um, but also be honest. Uh, always request a copy of the exam afterwards uh, so that you can look at it and, and make sure that it's an adequate you know, representation of what you thought you went through. Uh, remember that the uh, examiner isn't going to be somebody that you've necessarily met 
ever before and they're typically not very long so that's why it's always good to um to supplement your own record with your own private treatment doctors or even the doctors that you treat with at the va center as well as your life statements and VA actually can deny the claim outright if you don't if show you don't up to show your examination. Up, yeah. So that's something that's it's really, really important, important to, to remember because um, that's a long time sometimes to get to that stage. Mm -hmm. um, definitely go and continue on with your claim. Any other thoughts, Mike? So I'd just like to emphasize really the importance of lay statements in the context yeah. of a headaches claim. And so in, in my opinion at least, lay statements will really make or break your case in mm -hmm. the context of a headaches case. Um, and the reason for that is partially because it's very difficult for somebody else to assess the severity of your condition when it comes to headaches. And there's no, be there's no person positioned better than the veteran to be able to detail yeah. the severity of their condition, the frequency of their condition, how chronic their condition is, the duration, and the impact that it has on their, on, uh, basically on their employment. Um, the veteran is best positioned for that, and their lay statement will be credible um, in helping detail some of those things. So I think when you look at the diagnostic code and specifically what it requires, mm -hmm. veterans should keep in mind um, that in their lay statements, they should really focus in on the frequency of their headaches. Yep. The you know how chronic their condition is. So um, has it lasted two times per month over the past six months, over the past year? You know sure. since you got out of service. Yep. Um, and finally, um, really the impact that it has on the veteran's daily activities and ability to work, and that goes yeah. to the prostrating. Uh, basically element within sure. the diagnostic code and so hitting those three things I think is really critical for a veteran um, when they're doing a detailed lay statement to be able to maximize the benefit under this diagnostic code. Yeah. And one uh, suggestion that I would have is that, as, as you said Elise the, the DBQs or the CMP examinations for headaches mm -hmm. kind of try to put every veteran in this one particular box that you might not fit so sort of synthesizing what you were suggesting what Mike was suggesting don't be afraid to submit a lay statement in response to the examination, especially if you're able to obtain a copy of it. Mm -hmm. It's more frequent than that. That's not what I said. You know, this is more severe, um, things of that nature. Don't be afraid to tell VA what you think of the examination uh, in a clear sort of direct way that focuses on maybe symptoms or severity that was missed in the context of that examination. Because less than five can be one, but less than five can also be four. <laughs> or, or, you know, or maybe they just misheard the VA examiner, maybe just heard your son to that effect. So that's, uh, that's a thought that I would um, leave everyone with. Any final thoughts in addition to what you've noted before we sign off? I guess I would just also say, you know, we talked about secondary service connection for a while. Um, there is also something called separate ratings. Uh, so you might even be compensated for something that's not necessarily under the headaches code if it's causing your headaches, for example, depression. Mm -hmm. um, but really what I want to say is um, when you are making claims or lay statements like Mike was saying, don't just think about what your headaches are doing as far as, you know, the light sensitivity. Are they also impacting other areas of your life other than work? Are they causing, you know, social problems? Are they causing depression? Are they causing irritability? Because those are all things that could potentially also be um, rateable. One, one, just one final thought from me, um, and it, this also appears in the VA's own adjudication manual. Sometimes it can be helpful for veterans to uh, create what what VA calls a headaches journal. Oh yeah. Um, and so that's something veterans can keep, which documents the date, the time, and the frequency of their headaches and the severity as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's something that if you know the veterans are experiencing headaches, they can they can submit, um, and that just is further evidence, further proof mm -hmm. to help substantiate their claim. Um, and like I said, there's nobody better to be able to assess that than the veteran. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think that's it for us today. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, again, my name is Christian McTarnigan, and today I was here with Elise Golosky and Mike Lestrito, and we were talking about headaches. Hope to see you again soon.